So when we start off, we're talking about the end of the Reformation era. And uh, what, what's the Reformation uh, in Europe? It's a religious thing, right? So what are the two Christian religions we have these, to these days, the two divisions? And the, they don't really seem like divisions to most Christians. They seem like they're not divisions at all, right? We have Protestants and Catholics, right? Protestants and Catholics. There are many types of Protestant, of course, but they are two separate categories because of the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church was, of course, really, you can think of it in, in the sense that it was the only church um, throughout the Middle Ages. Of course, it wasn't the only church. They, they um, spent a great amount of effort wiping out uh, uh, heretics and that sort of thing. But when the Reformation begins, we have some interesting things that happen that move Europe to a modern state. So let's look at this map and we'll get a kind of idea of the scene and then we'll move from there. Um, this body of water right here, and this body of water connects to the Atlantic, but, it, um, but it's not called the Atlantic. What is this area? What's this body of water called right here? Mediterranean Sea, yeah, very good. And the Mediterranean Sea is economically where everything is happening up to the end of the Reformation. This is where all the money is coming from. These are where all your powers are. Kind of look what I'm touching upon here. These are your major powers. When we think of World War I and World War II later on, we think of powers that are here, right, in the north. But before the Reformation, most of your money is in the south, in the Mediterranean economy, okay? So um, as the Reformation is starting up, Spain is one of your most powerful, uh, powerful kingdoms. Um, we have ports in southern France, both sides of Italy, uh, Venice, and Genoa, uh, Rome. Um, you have Sicily down here, major ports that are trading uh, with the, the greatest powers, whether it's the Ottoman Turks over here, um, that sort of thing. You actually have Egypt down here, not a powerful place at this point. Um, but this is where most of your economy is. Um, France will become a major player by the end of the Reformation, but it's simply not as powerful at the beginning, and we'll explain why. Um, this is Greece down here. When we think in terms of uh, the powerful forces of the ancient world, um, we're looking at Mesopotamia over here, Babylon, Turkey, Egypt, Greece, Rome. That's all Mediterranean-based pretty much. The Black Sea, part of the Mediterranean, economically speaking. Um, our first major event uh, with the Reformation actually takes place uh, in the north around Germany. Now, when we start off, we're right at the end of the Reformation. Now, I'm not going to explain how the Reformation necessarily began, um, but the Renaissance has already happened. And now, when I talk about the Mediterranean economy, um, this is the economy that allowed the Renaissance to happen. The Medici families, even some royal families in France, but mainly the Renaissance happened south of Switzerland. And the Renaissance was a great amount of money spent by cities and wealthy families and kings on architecture and city development. And when you think of the Renaissance, you think of statues and just beautiful embellished works of architecture. Now, the Reformation, on the other hand, the religious Reformation, when um, these priests and startups even begin protesting against the Catholic Church. So you have like Martin Luther and John Calvin breaking away and becoming what we now call Protestants. Uh, you can think of the word protest. They're protesting the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, um, does anyone know why Martin Luther, uh, what problem Martin Luther had with the Roman Catholic Church? Indulgences? Yeah. Uh, what are indulgences? Get out of hell, free card, kind of, yeah. Get out of purgatory. Um, Christians back in this era and throughout a lot of the Middle Ages believed in something that Christians these days don't believe in, that they would, they would a lot of them think I'm just making this up, but Christians back then believed in a place called purgatory. You hear about purgatory in literature and, and that sort of thing, poetry and music, but it was a real belief at one time. Christians really believed that... Well, Roman Catholics and others 
really believe that this is earth here. This is your mortal existence. And this is hell. And there are several levels to hell. Um, like if you read Dante's Inferno, called it, he called, it was the Inferno. And then there is this, which is called Purgatory. And uh, Dante Alighieri wrote a famous book called Purgatorio. And Purgatory, notice that in the Inferno is when you're kind of descending. It's where you stay forever, like after you go to hell, right? It's hell. Um, purgatory is actually kind of a good thing. Those are clouds. The sun. Purgatory is where everyone has sin, right? Christians usually believe in original sin. In other words, even before you were born, you had sin um, from which you need to be forgiven. So the Christ figure forgives us. We all have sin, even if we're perfect, which no one is, of course. And because of that, instead of what we believe now is that Christ forgives you when you go to heaven after you, right after you die, no, they didn't believe that. They believe you have to work out your sin and go through these different stages of purgatory. And some people start higher up than others, right? Because their sin isn't as much. So it doesn't take as long to get to heaven. But if you buy an indulgence from the Roman Catholic Church or one of their priests, and that money, of course, goes to the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, um, then you can get out of purgatory. You get a get out of purgatory free card. Um, not only can you buy this for yourself, you can buy this for relatives or anyone else. Not only can you buy it for yourself and other people, you can buy it for people who have already passed away. So once you get a chunk of coin, you can get your grandma out of purgatory, right? You've been working for a couple years, but you have to feed your family, and you finally get some extra money, you're going to get Grammy out of purgatory, right? You're going to make sure she's going to heaven quicker so she doesn't spend, have to spend as much time suffering in like a limbo, okay? So the indulgence is uh, just one component that really angered Martin Luther. Martin Luther protested from the Catholic Church, um, nailed his 95 thesis to the church door, and a lot of people say the Protestant Reformation began then. So all these other Protestant cells began rebelling. And of course, even at the very beginning, there are many different types of Protestant. They don't all agree with each other. Protestantism is mainly built on the idea um, that people need to read the Bible for themselves. The Reformation happens. The Reformation is, a lot of historians think of the Reformation as the Northern Renaissance. So here's the Renaissance. And then right after the Renaissance, as money is filtering northward, the Reformation begins. There's a huge amount of money pouring through. There's more people that have free time, more people that can read, more Bibles being translated into local dialects. So it was Martin Luther that took the Latin Bible, the Vulgate, and translated it into a German dialect that he spoke. And so with the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press, and all these Bibles being translated into local languages, you have the birth of the Reformation. So the Catholic Church is very threatened. It was the Catholic Church who um, generally didn't want people reading the Bible and coming up with their own conclusions. And I think there's good reason to say that. It's because that's what happens. Uh, you know, people come up with their own interpretation. And so with Protestantism, you get thousands of religions, just Protestant religions, just popping out, and they're all distinct based on individual interpretations of Scripture. But it's also a good thing because now you can free up, you know, Scripture that's been enmeshed in, um, in, in doctrine from a centralized church uh, that's been, you know, slowly a single force that's been determining doctrine. Now Protestants can start a they can start thinking about early Christians. You know, what, how did early Christians behave? Um, what did they think? You know, let's start questioning things. So with Protestantism, sometimes you get some real radical differences between what kind of Christian they are versus a Catholic. Um, but not as much as, um, as you might think. Protestants imitate a large amount of Catholicism. Protestantism was a reaction to Catholicism, and they didn't successfully go back to early Christianity. If they did, the Sabbath would be on Saturday. We would, we would be following Jewish custom because Christianity is a Jewish religion. 
Um, but once the church through many hundreds of years was separated from the Jewish religion and then Protestants came along, it became separated from this Southern Roman Catholic ideal and it became closer to what we think of now uh, as Christianity. Okay, so with that said, that causes huge problems with not only the church, but all these emperors and kings who are in power because the Pope validates them. So there are some power structures that are threatened aside from the church. There are economic structures. Uh, princes in Germany and areas, especially in Germany and areas in the north, Sweden, that sort of thing, powerful princes would support Protestant uh, leaders because they wanted to take power away from the Roman Catholic Church. German princes had their own independent power, so there were nobility who actually favored Protestantism in the north. Keep in mind that trade and wealth is increasing, increasing at this time, and people are realizing that they have enough money, they can be independent, more people can read, so people are beginning to question, question things. And when you read, ooh, Pandora's box is opened when you can begin reading for yourself, then some of these old power structures kind of fall apart. So they really shook things up with the Protestant Reformation. But fast forward, and it's at, it's at the end of the Reformation. And the big picture is moving toward the modern state. And this will be our big question, and we'll address this more, is how did the Thirty Years' War, which is really the war that symbolizes the end of the Reformation, and I'll, I'll address that more later. How did that move us closer to the modern state? And so before we can actually answer that question, we have to figure out what in the world is a modern state versus the, you know, pre-modern state. So let's, let's talk about this. And these are all good talking points, you know, when you're at the bar, you know, tonight, you can just bring these up and people will be really glad that you did. Not really. Okay, so what makes the modern state? Um, it's a modern form of government. What is a modern form of government? Well, there's no aristocracy calling the shots, right? That's one thing. Uh, we're capitalists. We're a capitalist republic, right? Like, like in the United States. Or a modern communist, right? They both rely heavily on industry, just like capitalism does. So they're actually very similar. Communism as it exists today is, is actually uh, somewhat similar to cap uh, industrial capitalism. Uh, it just operates differently with the government at the center. Okay, so it has to have a modern form of government. Now, if, if the church and the nobility are running things during the Thirty Years' War, it's, it's not a modern form of government. So that's not the thing that does it. Separation of church and state, that's an aspect of modern government. Um, it's an assumed aspect of modern government. Today, we, we assume that separation of church and state, that secularization is a part of the modern state, but that's only because of how we grew into the modern state because of things that happened in the 19th century um, and that sort of thing. It doesn't, you can have a modern state and be highly religious. A lot of people are realizing that. Um, bringing the church into the state is a major problem. And it's the Thirty Years' War. It's a lot of bloodshed and death that convinces many Europeans that the church and the state should not be holding hands at all. The church should be sacred. It should be separate from state uh, sort of idea. So these new ideas are being formed. Because you know, throughout the Middle Ages and up to the Reformation, church and state were holding hands very, very closely. It's the pope that validated the aristocracy. You know. OK, so let's move on. Modern taxation. Since the earliest civilization, there's been a form of taxation. So, uh, so even if you don't have coins, the way the early Sumerians and Egyptians basically tax their people is through goods and services. So in other words, a certain amount of your crops go toward the center to be redistributed, and a certain amount of your labor in the off season would go to build structures like the pyramids. Um, early civilizations were based on organized labor. And that is actually a sort of proto-taxation. So as, as various cities and civilizations gain coin, uh, leaders and kings realize they can tax that coin. It moves to the center and you can fund things like standing armies. So modern taxation is just an advanced taxation practice um, that's highly regulated and predictable. Like when we file for our taxes, there's a system, there's a mathematical algorithm, <laughs> you know, we use to figure out our taxes. 
There are, of course, loopholes, but that's the idea of modern taxation. Europe has already started moving towards modern taxation. The Hundred Years' War has already happened. War is the one factor that increases taxation quickly throughout history. So if you see a, a, a country, culture, nation embracing more advanced taxation practices, it usually follows a great war where that money is needed. Um, and then modern state, urbanism, meaning cities. Industrialization, that's modern industrialization, from textile mills to steel and coal, railroad tracks. And then consumerism. Consumerism is often overlooked. Consumerism is the basis of modern society. It's the basis of capitalism. It's us, the consumers, buying stuff. Recreation, food, gas, vehicles, houses, clothes, toys. It's what makes capitalism happen in this advanced modern era. In the, uh, in early, in the early industrial era, it was big buyers that bought steel and bridges and railroads that made capitalism happen. But, but capitalism exists now in a major way because of the small people that buy, are buying everyday goods in mass. So that, makes, that gives you an idea of, well, what is the modern state? What sets, sets it apart from the previous state? And so your main question will be for this week, and, and I'll have you answer this yourselves. How did the Thirty Years' War move Europe closer to the modern state? And here are some hints for you. It began over one reason, but eventually took on a different character with different motives. So when we talk about this war moving us closer to a modern state, it started for one reason and then it ended up being for a different one. And once you figure that out, you'll be able to answer that question. Religion played a key role at the beginning of the war. It did not play a key role toward the end of the war. And um, if you can explain that, you'll also be able to answer that question. 30 years war, it lasts till 1648. It lasts 30 years, so 1618 to 1648. 1648 might be good if you remember 1648. 1648 is when the Thirty Years' War ended, and it's when the Peace Treaty of Westphalia was signed, and things began to change, moving towards a secularized state. So what's been happening, I've been talking about sort of how the Reformation started, but the militant phase of the Reformation is very bloody. It's, it's a horrible situation. And it's over religion. We look at that idea today and we're reviled by it. The idea of people fighting over religion. It just seems like a waste. So some of the things that have been happening in the Holy Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire at this time is like Germany, Germanic tribes, some of Bohemia, you know, Austria, part of Poland and Hungary. The Holy Roman Empire is right here. Rome is down here. <laughs> It's just an empire that was validated by the Pope. So it's not holy, it's not Roman, and it's barely even an empire, but it's called the Holy Roman Empire. And this is where Protestantism really starts. And um, the Holy Roman Empire has different areas that are divided among princes. And there's a main archduke that kind of runs things. But it's really the smaller princes and kings that are calling the shots in their own area. And so some of your first Protestants are the Lutherans from uh, Martin Luther, and they're not real radical. They're kind of docile, actually. Um, they just want people to read the Bible and interpret it for themselves. But then there's another Protestant group known as the Calvinists, and they're much more radical. And as these conflicts are happening throughout the Holy Roman Empire, uh, religion versus religion, there's finally, in 1555, the Peace of Augsburg, finally a settlement. So in the Holy Roman Empire in 1555, all of a sudden, they make concessions. They're like, okay, we're okay with Lutherans. Lutherans can now practice their religion in the Holy Roman Empire. But Calvinists, no, we are not going to let you guys in. You guys are, are, uh, are, are radical, way too radical. So the Calvinists, which is interesting, they begin kind of uh, having an aggressive missionary campaign. And a lot of them start moving into places like France. And so then you start getting the French wars of religion because all these Calvinists are relocating. And one of the important ruling families of France is the Bourbon family. And the Bourbon family basically becomes, um, what's the word, uh, converted. They convert to Calvinism. And French Calvinists are known as Huguenots. You're going to run into that word quite a bit. And so you get all these Huguenots 
in France and a ruling family that becomes Calvinist. And the Catholic nobility basically runs France at this point. So the Catholics are really upset with this Bourbon family who are claiming to be Calvinist and, uh, and the Huguenots themselves. So they form a Catholic league with Spain. Spain is very powerful at this time. And um, basically you're on the verge of uh, France basically making Protestantism completely illegal and kicking them out, right? So France would be totally Catholic. So Henry of Navarre is a member of the Bourbon family. Remember, they're Calvinist. And he's actually next in line to be king of France. And he makes uh, what's, what I call a pawn sacrifice. When you're playing chess, you can sacrifice your pawn to, say, take a queen or a knight or a more important piece from your enemy. And so what Henry IV does, he actually denounces Calvinism and converts to Catholicism because that's what the Catholic, Catholics want. He says, okay, I'll convert, but stop, stop bullying the Calvinists. I'll convert your king will be a Catholic like you want, so it's almost like a trade-off, right? There's a compromise. And so by making this pawn sacrifice, he's able to, throughout his reign, actually defeat the ultra-Catholic opposition and drive out the Spanish. And what that means is to drive out the Spanish out of France is sort of like diplomats and lobbyists, if you want to think of it in modern terms. You're getting the Spaniards, the wealthy, influential Spaniards, out of your French court. It's hard for us to think at this time that Spain was a major power in Europe because at this time Spain is, is uh, not super wealthy and uh, for their area, for their amount of size, they're, they're underpopulated. So it's a different reality. And so this grants a large amount of freedom to Huguenots uh, in France. So Protestants are making inroads in parts of France and Germany. Then the Thirty Years' War happens uh, in 1618, kind of close to that same right after the French Wars of Religion. 